Good morning. So today is the 24th of December, 2022. And um, tomorrow, Christmas Day, of course, it's a Sunday. And as a church here, we've decided that um, we're going to close our meeting tomorrow because we want to spend time with our families. And it's a great thing. We usually meet on a Sunday afternoon at 3, 3 o'clock here in Gateway in Rottenstall. But um, tomorrow... We're going to give it a break. But at the same time, I've been speaking to my friends in India. And um, I just sense, you know, there's, there's a part that I, have, I haven't actually covered in the Christmas story leading up to uh, Christmas time. And so what a great opportunity to do that now. We've looked at the... Um, <clears throat> let's have a think now. We've looked at... The last one, actually, we looked at was the, uh, the shepherds on the hill. What a great message. That on... My that, that that was not normal. It was a not normal day. I don't know if you remember that. Not normal. And I and I mentioned that God is not normal in our thinking of normal. So that was that message. Uh, the, the message before we've we've done message about Mary being the Virgin and um, God overpowered her. We did the message about Anna uh, and Simeon in the temple who had waited so long. And then Simeon lifts up Jesus, the baby boy Jesus. And he says, my eyes have seen the salvation of all men. Wow. So this is what a powerful, wonderful, uh, oof, powerful, wonderful story. We are so blessed. If you're a believer, you are blessed beyond measure. I, I'm not bothered. No, I shouldn't say I'm not bothered because I am, of course. But, but we shouldn't be over, overwhelmed by... The things around us that are robbing us of uh, an amazing peace that God offers us. You know, if you've invited Jesus Christ into your life, uh, if you've confessed your sins, if you've repented, you've invited Jesus into your life, then you will be saved. That's what the Bible clearly says. You know, we have a, we have a message over the top of the cross over there. It says, Romans 10 verse 9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. Romans 10 verse 9. You will be saved. So if you've done that. If you've done that. Confess with your mouth. I confess today. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my saviour. Jesus is my protector. Jesus is my provider. He is the one that died on the cross. His blood set me free. Hallelujah. And I am so blessed. And I confess that with my mouth. And I believe it in my heart. I know everything. I can't explain it. You know, some things are unexplainable. Well, that is unexplainable for me. I can't explain it, but I know that Jesus lives in me. And I know that Jesus speaks to me and encourages me. And he'll do the same for you. And so I know he lives in my heart. And I know and I believe with all my heart, with everything in me, that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Hallelujah. Not, not only do we have the abundant proof of the disciples and at times, one time 500 together, and Jesus meeting and eating fish and all the stories, all the accounts of when Jesus uh, showed. Even the very, very first day on the very first morning when the ladies went to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus. To anoint him. And we're looking at that uh, this, uh, this, this, in this video. To anoint him for the burial of Jesus. To anoint him. And he wasn't there. <laughs> Why do you look for the living amongst the dead, said the angels. He's not here. He has risen. Oh. And so I want to encourage you this Christmas time. Let Jesus rise up in you. When you wake up on a Christmas morning, or if this, if you watch this video after Christmas, then whenever you wake up, it, it's not tied to a Christmas day. This is a message. It's for every day. When we wake up, that we can say, Lord Jesus, I want to thank you. And we can trust and we can believe this is our God. So let's be encouraged. Um, here we are, we're going to do it. So we've done what I've said. Now we're going to look into Matthew chapter 2. And in Matthew chapter 2, we are, um, we're looking where the wise men. Matthew's the only uh, writer of the four Gospels that mentioned the, the wise men. Of course, history and, and um, I don't know, religion over the years. And, you know, uh, just story after story. There, there are some things that's added to it. But the core of the message are the three gifts. And we're going to look at the three gifts. 
Come on. Let's go. I'm excited. So, hallelujah. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for anyone who would watch this. Thank you, Jesus, that you are with us. You are for us and not against us. Thank you, Jesus, that you love us. Thank you, Jesus, that even though we suffer in times of trial, that, Lord God, we should count those sufferings as good because they lead us back to you and they keep us held firm. Father God, thank you. Humbly, Lord, we come before you today. Humbly before your word. Holy Spirit, would you anoint your word. Set it on fire in the powerful name of Jesus. Corsi tarabata sianda. All heaven gets excited over this message. All the angels, the powerful angels, the anointed one, the ones that, the elders that cry, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Hallelujah. This is our God. Hallelujah. Woo. Calm down. Oh no. Oh no. Stop. Spill me water. <laughs> I'm getting a bit excited. I want to start to bounce in this uh, table anyway. You don't need to know all that. You don't need to know all that. So let's have a look. Matthew chapter 2. I'll just take this out of this case. Just remove this out of this case. You know, sometimes the Word of God, we can know it and it can be in us. And we can know the Scriptures. But we don't allow it to come out of us. So the first word today is God wants to speak to us and says, Let the word of God, let him come out of you today. Let him come out of you. You know, love your neighbour as yourself. So love yourself. Listen, I'm digressing. Matthew chapter 2. Hallelujah. We're on fire today, boy. We're on fire today. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem and Judea, during the time of King Herod, now Magi, 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 whatever. Some people say, uh, some of the scholars say that they were, could well have been ast astrologers. Uh, some uh, over history, uh, repu uh, reputation, not reputation. Um, what can I say? I don't know what the word is for it. Anyway, some people have called them three kings or three wise men. Um, just a word, it won't come, it doesn't matter. But, but anyway, it says in Matthew, it says uh, the, the visit, of, they visit the Messiah. And they came from the east and they came to Jerusalem and they asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? They know one thing. They know that a child has been born. They know that something special has taken place because they've seen an amazing star. So the, that's why they possibly could be astrology because they're looking, study the stars on this one star. God puts this one star among so many stars to shine brighter than all the other stars. And that is the one that got their attention. And you know, in us, in our lives, <coughs> there are people, the Bible tells us that we should shine like stars, that God can use us for others to get other people's attention. In the name of Jesus. How do you like this fella? I'll put him there on purpose. We might, I'll show you later. So, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and we've come to worship him. So they saw this star, they studied the star and then they studied the, they studied the, uh, I don't know, they studied the writings of, of that time uh, from the wise men. Uh, from the prophets, from the learned people, the learned scholars, and they deduced, looking at this star, that there was a Messiah born, there was a king that is born, and they came to worship him. Well, it just so happens that uh, they came to Jerusalem, and King Herod was in charge of Jerusalem at that time. He was king, so they thought they'll come to Jerusalem, and King Herod, he heard all about this, and he was a little bit disturbed, so he got, he got his... His people's chief priests and teachers of the Lord, he said to them, where was the Messiah going to be born? Everybody, you need to understand this. People expected a Messiah to come. They were waiting for a Messiah. In, 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 the, in the writing, see, it says, he, he, he got his 
teachers of the law. He got the chief priests and he asked where the Messiah was to be born. See, King Herod was probably from Jewish descent, so he would have known some of this stuff. And, and they could, they probably called him, like he was like the puppet king, you know, whatever. He was allowed to be in charge by the Romans and he was in charge, but he had to do everything that they said. So in a way, in a way he was, he was a, a Jew or part Jew and he was a king. But the Roman authorities, they said you can only be king providing you do what we tell you to do. And so he would be described as the puppet king, you know. I wonder in life, who's pulling your strings? <laughs> who's pulling my strings? Who are we the puppet to? Are we the puppet to the world, the king of the world, or the god of this age, little g? Or are we, are we the puppet to the king of kings and the lord of lords, Jesus? I want to be God's puppet. I want God to move me where he needs to move me. I want to do the things God wants me to do. I don't want to do the things that the world wants me to do or other people. I want to do what God wants me to do. Hallelujah. Anyway, this puppet king, he realised and they said, he realised that, uh, that there was something going on. And, uh, and after the meeting, it said that the Messiah, this king, he would be born in Jerusalem, Bethlehem in Judea. And it said, this is what is written. And, and the proof was there, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. So Herod called the, the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time that the star had appeared. So he must have had a conversation. They sat down and they, they came together. They probably had a meal together and they discussed what was going on. And, and when did this star appear? And we're not actually told when the star actually appeared. We're not told that. But then he sent them to Bethlehem. And he said, go and search carefully for the child. You see, he knew, did Herod, that these three wise men from the east, astrologers, whatever you want to call them, but these three men were called by God. God put a star in the sky as a sign to these three men. The Bible, the Christmas story is all about signs. We heard how the angels said to the uh, shepherds up on the hill, this will be a sign. The baby will be in a manger. And, and, and God showed us that you don't normally put a newborn baby in a manger. It's unheard. It's not a dumb thing. It's not normal. And so this again is a situation where there's a star. This star was bright. It, it's not normal. And the astrologers saw this star and they were gazed at the star. They thought, wow, what's going on? What's going on? And so they studied it and God called them. And God spoke to them. Go and follow that star. Follow the star. Because when you follow the star, you'll find my star, my son, Jesus, the King of Kings. The Lord of Lords. <laughs> so he said, go and search carefully. And when you find him, come and tell me so that I can go and worship him as well. So after they'd heard that the king, they went on the way. And the star they had seen, when it rose, it went ahead of them. So the star moved and they followed the star, went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. Imagine, this is not normal. Not ordinary. These things don't happen. And yet God, God, in order to show the whole world just who he is, that a child has been born, his son has been born, this is where they came. <laughs> when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. They thought at last they got excited, overjoyed. Have you been so excited? You've been looking. Imagine we don't know how long they've been following it. We don't know, maybe the star was born when the child was conceived. Hallelujah. Maybe, maybe the star was born when the child was conceived in Mary. And for nine long months, these three men who first saw the star, maybe nine months, I don't know. But I'm thinking that there wasn't a star until there was a conception. Hallelujah. I'm thinking that the star started life. God put the star there 
when he put his son there. Hallelujah. And these men who are from the east, from, from uh, many miles away, saw this star and studied it and deduced after time of studying, after time of looking, that, that it pointed to the, a, a Messiah being born. A Messiah being born. They actually didn't really know where. So the interesting thing about Herod is, <laughs> Herod actually gave them the information. Because they came to her and said, well, we're, we, we're looking for this, we're looking for a king. They came to her and so it's, it's, it's really interesting how God will use the most unusual uh, situations and people in our lives to point us in the right direction. Hallelujah. You know, God can use a puppet king who has only one thought in his head. He needs to kill this king of the Jews because if this king of the Jews lives, he loses his life. He loses his job. And so King Herod, he needed to protect his kingdom. He needed, not that he had a kingdom, but he needed to protect his position, the wealth that he had and the luxury of life he had. He needed to protect that. And in order to protect that, he, was, he chose that he would kill the baby. How many of us in our lives in order to protect what we've got in the world, we choose to kill the baby. We ignore the baby. We ignore Jesus. We ignore the son of the living God. We ignore him because we know that our luxury and our lifestyle, when we, when we choose Jesus, when we follow Jesus, when we allow Jesus to be Lord, then we can't be Lord. So our kingdom, me, myself, I, we must die. That's why Jesus said we must die to the flesh. And this king, King Herod, he was a little bit like that. And he did not want to lose his kingdom. But it's interesting how God used him to tell the three wise men where Jesus was in Bethlehem. I love it. Our God knows all things. There's nothing that our God cannot do. And so anyway, so when they saw the sign, they were overjoyed. And then come, and on coming to the house... They saw the child with his mother Mary. Interesting that they came to the house now. And it tells us that quite possibly that Mary and Joseph had moved out of the barn with the baby. And now had moved and somebody, maybe, I don't know, give them in a house. Allowed them to stay in their house. Uh, I don't know. But Matthew reports that they were in a house. They were in a house. And it said, that the, the, the three wise men, it said, when they came to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary. They saw the child with his mother Mary. And they bowed down and worshipped him. Hallelujah. They bowed down and worshipped him. They, were in no, they had no mistake about them. In their hearts, they knew that this was the king that was to come, the king, the Messiah. This, they knew that this baby child was the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. Then they opened treasures, gifts. And it's these gifts that we're going to have a look at today. They presented him with gifts of gold, gifts of frankincense, and gifts of myrrh. That's probably why we have three wise men. One gave gold, one gave frankincense, one gave myrrh. And, and, and in the narrative of the Christmas story, that's what we have. We have the three wise men. But I would imagine there was more than just three. I would imagine there was a group of them. Uh, you know, three wise men, wealthy wise men, are not going traveling, going to travel on their own. They'll take servants with them. They'll take others with them. So I would imagine there was more, but that doesn't matter. We're not really interested in that. You see, what happens in our lives and in who we are, and when we follow God and when we, we trust in God and we read the scriptures, we quite often tune in to uh, the flesh side of things, but miss the bigger picture of what God is doing. And God's, what God's doing, and I've noticed in the messages that He's given us recently, is he's, he's revealing the deeper spiritual meaning of what's going on here. And so he had gold, frankincense and myrrh. And then listen to this in verse 12. We'll come back to that. In verse 12 he says... Then the, 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 three, the three, let's call them three kings, three wise men, three astrologers, said, having, they got warned in a dream 
not to go back to Herod. They returned to their country by another route. Who do you think warned them in the dream? God, the Father of Jesus, warned them in the dream. Don't go back to Herod, go back another way. Because God needed now to get his son to safety. And the story goes that, uh, that an angel appeared. God said, well, okay. They go to Egypt, it said in verse 13. When the three wise men, or, you know, when they'd left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. And he said, get up. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Told you earlier, Herod, the puppet king, needed to take care of his puppet kingdom. Hallelujah. So, the first thing we're going to look at is we're going to look at the gold. And gold represents wealth. Gold represents authority. Gold represents kings. Kings have gold. And so the gold that the wise men had given to Jesus was to signify that Jesus is the king. Not only the king of the, of, of, of the Jews, but the king of the whole world. You see, he's God's son, the king of all creation. This is Jesus, the son of the living God. He is king. Let's have a look at this story in Matthew 17. In Matthew chapter 17... Uh, we read that Jesus uh, predicts his death a second time. The second time he tells that he's going to be put to death. And he said in verse 22 of Matthew 17, when they came together in Galilee, Jesus said to them, listen, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They're going to kill him. And on the third day, he will be raised to, the light, raised to life. But his disciples were filled with grief. So Jesus is now a man, he's grown and uh, remember the gold that was given to him at birth is now showing the authority of who this Son of God really is. And it says this in verse 24. And in this little narrative, in this little passage that we look at with Peter and Jesus, we see that Jesus makes no excuse of who he is. He, makes, he doesn't beat him out of the bush. He explains exactly. He said after Jesus and his disciples... They came back to Capernaum and he said, the collectors of the two drachma temple tax came to Peter. So he came to Capernaum and, and when they came there, uh, they would have to uh, pay temple tax. So they came to Peter and they said, um, doesn't your teacher, doesn't he pay temple tax? Yes, he does, Peter replied. And they said, when... When Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. You see, Jesus already knew that they'd, they'd taken Peter to one side, the, the, I don't know, the, the tax collectors for the temple. And so Peter, and Jesus says this to him. He says, Simon, what do you think, Simon? He said, who do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? Do they collect them from their own children? You know, the princes, the prince and princesses their own family? Do they collect taxes from their own family? Or do they collect the taxes from the children of others? Well, we all know that the kings of the earth collect taxes from everybody else. I pay tax, you pay tax, we all pay taxes. But mark my words, that back in this time, the king's sons or daughters would not pay taxes. They would be exempt from paying taxes. Peter said that, he answered correctly. From others, Peter said. So Jesus says, so therefore that the children are exempt. The children are exempt. In other words, the children do not pay taxes. So Jesus said to him, but so that we may not cause offence. <laughs> I love Jesus. He just knows exactly who he is. And sometimes, you know, sometimes in life we, we need to do things... We know what the truth is, okay? We know the position we're in. We know when we're right. But sometimes, rather than, you know, saying I'm right and digging our heels in, sometimes we have to just take a step back and humble ourselves, knowing that we're right, but humbling ourselves so as not to cause offence with others. Because we know that if we cause offence, what's going to happen? 
we'll get in some crazy argument. Because the people that are asking for this temple tax are the people that are adamant that they want their point putting across that they're right. The chances are that within them people is the problem. Is the problem. I'm not saying that we don't have problems, but when you know you're right, when you are walking in the righteousness of God and you know you are right, and somebody's accusing you of something you've done that you haven't done. Sometimes we have to humble ourselves and go through the process. Humble ourselves and grow. And Jesus is doing that. Jesus said, but so that we may not cause offence, go to the lake. I love this. Throw out your line. This is Jesus. This is Peter the fisherman, right? This is Peter the fisherman. Throw out your line. Take the first fish that you catch. Open its mouth and you'll find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. Now I don't know about you, but Peter the fisherman, it's brilliant. He must have thought, whoa, Peter knew who Jesus was. And you see, the whole point of the goal to represent that Jesus was the King of Kings wasn't only that the King of Kings, that Jesus has authority. Who else do you know? It's not normal to catch a fish and pull a four drachma coin out. Not only to catch a fish with any coin in its mouth, but to catch a fish with the exact amount of temple tax to pay the people and the temple. God, Jesus, the Son of God, Hallelujah. He has authority over all the earth, over the fish. Over the fish. We know he's got authority over the fish because he told his disciples, hey guys, you caught any fish? No. Throw your net on the other side. You will do. Uh, okay. <laughs> they throw the net over. Jesus has authority. And this Jesus that we worship, the Son of the living God, he has all authority because it's been given to him. Do you remember when he, he was tempted? The other day we looked at this. When he was tempted in the wilderness, um, Satan, the God, little G, of this world said, listen, if you bow down to me. He showed him all the kingdoms of the earth. He said, if you bow down to me, if you bow down to me, I'll give you all them. <laughs> Satan, trying to give, this is what I'm talking about, humbling. Jesus humbled him. Jesus could have snuffed him out if he wanted. Jesus humbled himself and he just said, well... It is written. It is written. It's in the word. It's in the word. See, Satan had no hold over Jesus. In other words, Jesus already owned all the kingdoms of the world and the earth. It's just that Satan is like her, the puppet king. Satan is the puppet king of the creation of the universe. Who are we going to worship? Who are we going to trust? Are we going to, are we going to follow Satan, the puppet king? Or are we going to follow the Jesus, the King of Kings? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love this word. I love how God just brings things together and links them together. It's amazing. Amazing. So he caught a fish and he pulled out a four drachma coin. So the gold represents the authority of, of who Jesus is. The gold represents the authority of who Jesus is. So now we want to have a look at the frankincense. Because they got gold, got frankincense. Frankincense was another gift. Gold, frankincense. Let's say it's the second gift. It's the second one that we're told about. Now frankincense, frankincense is a, it's like a, it's a spice, it's an aroma, it gives off a beautiful aroma. Uh, and and they, uh, they, they, they burn it probably in the temples. And, and it represents us the uh, smoke, as the smoke of the frankincense, as it goes up, kind of our prayers get, get attached to it and they, and they go up to heaven. So our prayers to God and our praise to God is like the frankincense, a beautiful, sweet aroma for God, for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And the frankincense that Jesus was given was a representation of who this, who this man will become, who he is this son of God, who he really is, that he's a man of prayer. And in Matthew verse 11, we read verse 25, 
And, I, and I've chose specifically Matthew's passages because it's Matthew is the only one that really talks about the wise men. So he said, at that time, Jesus said in prayer, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. What are these things? These things are the truths of the gospel. That we are in a place where God is revealing these amazing, wonderful truths of the gospel. You've re revealed them to little children. We are little children. We might not think we're little children, but we are God's children. And God loves us. And God honours and God blesses us. And Jesus said in verse 26, pray and said, yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. And he goes on, all things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. And those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And, and Jesus praying and he's there with his disciples and he's explaining that, that he is the Son of God and he knows the Father. Hallelujah. And frankincense represents this constant sweet aroma between Jesus, the Son of God and Father in heaven. And this constant coming together, a constant connection. And God encourages us to be the same, that we would have a constant connection with him and it is possible. Jesus, the Son of God, is our example. Hallelujah. He's the one that shows us the way. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. You know, there'll be other truths that you'll hear about. There'll be other ways that you'll be able to hear about. There'll be other lives that you'll hear about. Well, there's only one. And it's in the book. And it's Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He is the one that is a sweet aroma to his Father in heaven. And that's why... You know, I, I'm going to jump into Mark's, into Mark at the moment. In Mark, I think Mark, early, early chapter of Mark, I'm going to say three, but I'm not sure, it might be 1 verse 35. Anyway, it said, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus went to pray because he had this sweet aroma connection with his father all through his life, all through his 33 years, even on the cross, right at the very end, he had this sweet aroma with his father. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Those words that Jesus spoke as he hung on a cross, bleeding and dying, so that you and I can be, Woo! hallelujah, saved. This Christmas time, it's not just about a baby in a manger, it's not just about shepherds, it's not about prophets and prophetesses, it's not about the virgin. It's not about the three kings. It's about the king of kings, the son of the living God. It's about the signs that God himself set in place, put into motion, that under no circumstances made no mistake. You could not be mistaken. Oh, I hope we, have, I hope we haven't got it wrong. I hope, I hope Jesus really is the son of God. No, there can be no mistake. There was a virgin with a child, hallelujah. There was a manger with a baby, hallelujah. There can be no mistake. There were angels, archangels. Oh, Korabasita, everything. There was a star. There was three wise men. God had the whole thing covered. And you know the other thing about these three wise men? They represent you and I. They were non-Jews. They were Gentiles from the east. Gentiles, Gentiles, we are Gentiles, welcome, welcomed in, God wants everybody to know, and Peter tells us, in, 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 in 2 Peter 3 verse 9, I think it is, um, for God is not slow as you understand slowness, he doesn't want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, his son, I want to encourage you to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And then in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Oh, my goodness. He's just, he's just told them the second time. He's just revealed to them that he, he, he'll be going. 
He's going to die. He's going to be put to death. But he says, come to me all you who are weary and burdened. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle. I am humble in heart. We find that out when, with the track try my coin, humbled himself. And you, you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. A son of the living God was a man of prayer. A man of prayer. Now we need to look at myrrh. Myrrh was a sweet uh, uh, fragrance and uh, an anointing. It's like an, an oil. You know, uh, I went to uh, visit uh, Jenna some years ago. We had a customer in Jenna where we supplied furniture. And I went to Jenna and we, we see perfume and, and we see aftershave and uh, we splash it all over or whatever, you know. We do that and, or we spray it. Or I, we, and, and it's usually in a liquid form. And what, what I noticed when we went to Jenna is most of their expensive perfumes are in an oil form. It's like an oil. It's like mixed with oil and, and however they make it. But it's a very expensive perfume. It's oil. And uh, the three kings brought myrrh. And myrrh represents anointing. That, that as they brought this myrrh, it represents that this is the holy anointed one. Holy anointed one. And in Matthew 26, we're going to look at a story where Jesus was anointed. He said, while Jesus was in Bethany, in the home of Simon the leper. So this is in Matthew 26, verse 6. Jesus in Bethany, and he's at a home of a man called Simon, who probably once was a leper, and Jesus healed him. And so they just called him Simon the leper. I love that how, how they, they get, you know, how, how people went back in the day, you know, Peter the fisherman, you know, uh, you're Simon, but now you're going to be called uh, Cephas, Peter the rock. You know, and, 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 and God gives us names. And Simon the leper, this was his name, or this is what he was known as. He was probably given a meal of thanks because of what Jesus did to save him. So he said, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume. And he was there, was, Jesus sat there and they were having the meal and this woman came in with this and she poured this perfume on his head. She poured it on his head as Jesus was reclining at the table. Now this sort of thing does not happen. It's not normal. Do you know what? Since God spoke to us the other day about not normal, that he's a not normal God. In that, in, that, uh, in that preach we talked about, sometimes we have a not normal day. You know, like, everything's going great, then you have a not normal day. Everything goes crazy. Everything comes against you. Nothing works out right. And I, and I think on that moment I said, take your not normal day to the not normal God because he knows how to deal with it. And whatever you're going through in life, take it to God because it's not normal, what we call normal, to have to suffer in many ways. And so when we do suffer, we can use that suffering to take us to God. All that God wants us to do while we're on this earth, this planet, is to connect with him, to connect with him, to find him, to be born again, to be saved because there's something far greater to come. And we believe all this by faith. So when the disciples saw this, they were very indignant. They were annoyed. What's she doing? Why are you wasting that? What are you doing, woman? This is very expensive perfume. What is she doing? This perfume, we could have sold it for a really high price. You could have given her as a gift. We could have sold it. And we could have got the money and we could give it to the poor. What they're thinking, what they're probably really thinking is, and it was probably Judas, because Judas was the disciple that looked after the money, and Jesus actually knew that he used to help himself. So what they're really thinking, they're not really thinking of the poor. They're thinking, well, you're a bit to the poor, but for us, for us, you see, because they were still fleshly, worldly men. They still have the flesh. Judas still had that problem. They still had issues. Peter still had issues. 
We found that out when he denied Jesus. John Mark still had issues. John, he still had issues. These men of God still had issues. And you and I will still, even though we're with Jesus, we'll still have issues. But just give them to God. Just keep giving them to God because God's grace is sufficient and his forgiveness is amazing. So when the disciples saw this, they were indignant. What are they doing with this, you know, with this money? And aware of this, Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? You see, they were really having a go at her. One thing you need to remember is that women were not really held in high esteem. They were, they were beneath. So they would have been really having a go at her. And Jesus said, why are you bothering this woman? Why are you having a go at her? We all know when people gang up on us and have a go at us, it's, it's intimidating, it's fearful. And this woman was, was getting the, the intimidation and, the, and becoming fearful of these men. It must have been an awful point for her. There she's moved. She's been guided by the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit, up to this man, Jesus, to anoint him that this is not normal and it is another sign from heaven. God constantly sends signs. He constantly sends signs about Jesus' son and he constantly sends. So I call them clues. God leaves clues everywhere. He said, this perfume could have been sold. Aware of this, Jesus said to why are you borrowing this woman? She's done a beautiful thing to me. Verse 11, the poor you'll always have with you. The poor. But you will not always have me, Jesus says. And when she poured this perfume on my body, Jesus said, she did it to prepare me for my burial. Hallelujah. Isn't that amazing? That this woman came, that the body of Jesus was anointed, was anointed because God knew that when his son was put into the tomb on the first day, not on the first day, on the Sabbath, that the women could not go to anoint his son until the first day of the week. And that's when they went to anoint him. So even though, so it's a sign that Jesus is going to die. He said here, I'm going to die, I'm going to be buried. I'm going to be buried. And she's anointed me to prepare me for my burial. So this is a sign from God to say, yes, my son is going to be dead and buried. Dead and buried. And the anointing is because the women, by the time the women get a chance to come and anoint him, he'll already risen from the dead. Hallelujah. This is, this is beautiful stuff. I love it. And Jesus said this, truly I tell you, whenever this gospel is preached, this gospel, this good news, throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And here we have it written. In memory of this woman who anointed her. Why did God want this in his word? Because he wanted us to make no mistake that he knew that his son was going to be crucified, dead and buried. They took a dead body off the cross. Jesus this dead body that had already been anointed in the right way. In the right way. Myrrh, given at the birth of Jesus as a gift of a sign that 33 years later he would be anointed. So Jesus, this Son of God, gold, the King of Kings, frankincense, the Prince of Peace, myrrh, the Holy and Anointed One. Hallelujah. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this video because I've certainly enjoyed presenting it to you. And I just wanted to do this, right? You know, many of us, we walk through life and we sometimes think we're on our own. And we sometimes think that, I don't know, you ever get to that point where you feel alone? Well, this is a picture God wants you to see today because it might look like I'm alone, but look, my back's covered. I've got my back covered by this fellow. We're never alone. This is, this represents Jesus. The Lion of Judah. The Almighty One. The Holy One. The King of Kings. Yes, celebrate your Christmas however you do this Christmas. But let me tell you something. 
that the one that we are celebrating, the one that we are honouring, the one that we are worshipping is worthy of all our praise and worship. And he's got your back covered. Hallelujah. Be encouraged. Happy Christmas to you. If I don't speak to you before 2023, have a wonderful new year, but happy Christmas. Be blessed. Know that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, He cares for you. He cares for you. Whatever 2023 has got in store for us, let's know that God is with us. Amen. God bless.